Firstly, I want to thank Lavinia for uh, hosting us and having this and providing uh, three varieties of biscuits, um, uh, which is uh, better than the usual one variety. Uh, uh, but thank you for having us, Lavinia. I know it's not easy to coordinate two busy lawyers and two helper lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so thank you for making that effort. Um, Sham has identified one bright um, spot to this judgment. Um, let me identify another bright spot um, to not just this judgment but this process. Um, you know, as a younger lawyer, and I'm going to be selfish here since I have the mic, um, as a younger lawyer, so much of why we litigate is often inspired by the standard that is set for us. Um, and I think that for me, the brightest spot um, about this judgment that we lost has been the remarkably high standard um, that senior counsels Ashok Desai, Fali Nariman, and Sham Devan set for us. Uh, great litigation is about craft. It is about jurisprudential wisdom. Um, it is about resilience, but most importantly, great litigators are about heart. And the both of you on this panel, and Ms. Naiman's not here, is displayed, displayed so much of all of those characteristics, and you especially displayed heart when we lost this judgment. And for that, I just want to say that it has been a privilege, and I know I speak on behalf of all the younger lawyers on this team, Arvind, Basuman, Arundhati, so many of us. Thank you for setting the standard. Um, I'm going to very briefly um, start with two points that are larger points, and then I'm going to uh, negotiate um, uh, this judgment. Um, so very briefly. Zachary Elkins, Tom Ginsburg, and James Melton do some very interesting work. They do empirical work on why constitutions endure. It's very interesting, it's unique. They've studied 800 constitutions, they've done sample sets, and they identify a very interesting factor. That factor, in the context of countries where constitutions have endured, is the role that judges accord to themselves. And this is what they say. They say this, quote, judges have two roles in constitutional maintenance. One, judicial review facilitates common knowledge as to the violations of the constitution, facilitating enforcement and inhibiting transgressions. And two, judicial review involves updating the constitution to keep pace with change. Now, my understanding of this is that judges play an acutely important role, as has been empirically verified by these scholars, in ensuring that transgressions of the Constitution are inhibited, and ensuring that the court interprets the Constitution in a fashion that it keeps up with societal change. In my opinion, the Kaushal bench did neither of these two. As Sham rightly remarked, the Kaushal bench not only took away rights, but the Kaushal bench did not keep up with the changes in society. And by doing so, the Kaushal bench not only did not keep up with the changes in society, but they took us back to Victorian England. And by doing so, these two judges diminished the constitution of this country and diminished constitutionalism in this country. Now, the second thing that I'm struck by, and I said I would make two broad points before I get into the judgment, is that we are at a stage where we have gone through a process of review, and we are pre a process of a curative. Now, what this means with the negation of the review is that the Supreme Court lost an opportunity to self-correct. 
Well, let's be clear though, the Supreme Court didn't even take the opportunity to self-correct by not giving an open hearing. And to my mind, this is interesting because I, was, I have always been struck by the appointment process of judges in this country. The Constitution of India in Article 124.2 is very clear. It says that judges shall be appointed by the President after consultation with such of the judges of the Supreme Court and the High Court. And in the case of a judge who is not a Chief Justice, the Chief Justice of India shall be consulted. The Supreme Court, through its own jurisprudence to the three judges cases, has really arrogated to itself this conception of a collegium of judges that then appoints justices to the Supreme Court. Now the problem with this is that it may well be at odds with the constitutional text, but it also means that older judges are appointing younger judges and there is two consequences of this. One, there is little room to critique from within the institution, there is no room to self-correct and this is evidenced not just by a review or a lack of a review. This is evidenced by the abysmal lack of dissents today in the Supreme Court. Quality dissents are virtually negligible or don't exist on an annual basis. The appointment process of judges is expected to safeguard judicial independence. This is our prime concern with a good appointment process. Shimon Shitrit, a, a scholar who writes on judicial independence, says this, when judges are given a dominant role in appointment and promotion of judges, then there is greater risk of violation of judicial independence. Why? Because there is a hierarchical pa pattern within the judiciary and this chills judicial independence. And also, very simply put, you need more than one branch to balance out the other in the context of any appointment. So we in India have a unique appointment process where judges appoint other judges and have therefore left very little room for dissent or autocorrection. <clears throat> and I think having said those two things, I'm now just going to uh, briefly move on uh, to the judgment. I think. Uh, Mr. Desai and Mr. Devan have made all the big points that should be made and I'm just going to make a few smaller points. One, of course, it goes without saying that the judgment refused to engage arguments of Article 21, the right to life, Article 19, the freedom of expression. Uh, it had a flawed understanding, and, and this is probably because it was written in a hurried fashion, it had a flawed understanding of uh, that rather important article of the Indian Constitution, uh, the right to equality. Um, so one was very struck by how little of the arguments that were advanced by parties that supported the High Court judgment, um, that this judgment actually engaged in any meaningful fashion the non-engagement of legal arguments in a critical judgment is a source of great worry. Two, the reasoning of the judgment, and I have been very struck by an aspect of the judgment which Mr. Desa identified, the acts in question. And I'd like to really kind of very briefly touch upon this question of these acts. According to the court, it says, the acts which fall within the ambit of the section can only be determined with reference to the act itself and the circumstances in which it is executed, unquote. And the acts that the, that the court is trying to engage is those that are classified as carnal <coughs> intercourse against the order of nature. Now, how does the court try to understand these acts? It refers to a series of cases that involve the commission of these criminal acts. These cases include ones like R versus Jacobs, which the court cite, Kanu versus Emperor, which deals with carnal intercourse with the Bullock. It refers to Lohana versus State, Fazal Ram Chaudhary, and Kedarnath, all of which deal with anal sex with young boys, well below the age of consent, well below the age of 15, right? 
Finally, the court refers to Calvin Francis versus Orissa, which involved a six-year-old child performing oral sex. These are the cases that the Supreme Court of India chooses to highlight. Justice Singhvi relies on these cases to conclude that the acts fall within the advent of 377 can be determined with reference to the act itself and the circumstances in which it is executed. Fair enough, the judges rightly reason that these cases all deal with non-consensual and coercive situations. They observe, quote, we were apprehensive whether the court would rule similarly in a case of proved consensual intercourse between adults, unquote. However, they use this alleged apprehension to conclude that it is difficult to prepare a list of acts covered by the section. Strange, I think, given that the precedent that I've discussed with you all point to coercive sex involving children or animals. This is not just the biggest flaw of Suresh Kumar Kaushal. It is the next step that truly confounded me. Despite accepting that the cases pertaining to coercive, pertain to coercive sex, the judge finds that 377 will apply irrespective of age and consent. He goes on then to say that the section itself does not criminalize a particular people or identity or orientation. It merely identifies certain acts which if committed would constitute an offense. Such a prohibition, he says, regulates sexual conduct regardless of gender, identity, and orientation." Unquote. Now, I'm not going to deal with that in, in more detail. I think Mr. Devan and Mr. Desai have dealt with it eloquently. But I would like to perhaps end by talking about the judge's own jurisprudential inconsistencies. And this, in my opinion, is revealing about some of the motivations behind a judgment such as this. Justice Singhvi writes in his judgment that the court must exercise self-restraint in judicial review and there should be a presumption of constitutionality of legislation. He's right when he cites these as general principles. Yet this has never been a barrier to finding unconstitutional that which violates the protections offered by our constitution. This same judge who is writing of self-restraint in caution, says this in Delhi Jal Board versus National Campaign for Dignity and Rights of Severage and Allied Workers and Others in 2011. He says this, quote, whenever the judiciary has issued directions for ensuring that the right to equality, life, and liberty no longer remain illusory, a theoretical debate is started by raising the bogey of judicial activism or judicial overreach. In this case, Justice Singhvi upheld the Delhi High Court's orders providing free medical treatment, compensation for occupational illnesses, provision of modern equipment, soap and oil, restrooms, canteens, and even ex gratia payments for death. So clearly, his conception of judicial restraint is applicable only to specific cases and not to all the cases that he hears. Now, there are other bright spots, I think, in the outcome that is this judgment. The bright spots have been the extraordinary amount of conversation, debate, dissent, and support that has gone out um, with regard to the LGBT community in this country. The bright spots have been that the Supreme Court is no longer seen as necessarily the only bastion of change when it comes to LGBT rights in this country. And the final bright spot is I think it has in fact in many ways inspired a lot of younger people to actually think about activism, <coughs> writing, and all the other forms that democracies in fact absorb uh, towards kind of changing the ways that they uh, exist. So thank you very much.